Hey everyone and welcome back to my channel. I know that it's been a while, but I really needed to take a little bit of a break from my own mental health. <laughs> College really took it out of me. <laughs> so, and my little brother came home from basic training to spend the holidays with us. So I really just wanted to spend some time with him while I could. Oh, and he got married, yay. So it's exciting. Oh, let me show you something really cool, just really quick. Not that. <laughs> Rude. Okay, so. Old lamp. <laughs> My almost in-laws, we are not married yet, got me this awesome brush set. It has so many brushes in it. And then my almost brother-in-law and his fiance got me, look at how cool this is. I love it. I'm big into skulls, big into punk stuff. So it's right up my alley. Yay. <laughs> so we're back with makeup and history. First one of the year. Today's makeup and history is going to be on the Romanoff family. As always, I'm going to have the products I use and the sources that I used listed in the description for anybody who is interested. This is already going to be a tough one because I'm already stuttering and my script is over <laughs> three pages long. When Russia became consumed with revolution in 1917, Tsar Nicholas II and his family were deposed imprisoned, and later executed in July of 1918. These events gave way to communist Russia and the Soviet Union. The bodies of the last ruler of the Romanov dynasty and his family were first discovered in 1978. So what led up to their execution? The history of the Romanov dynasty dates all the way back to 1613. Their path to power began with the death of Ivan IV, otherwise known as Ivan the Terrible in March of 1584. This left his son, Theodore I, in power from 1584 to 1598. During Fyodor's rule, Boris Gudinov, his brother-in-law, along with the Romanovs, heavily contested his right to rule. When Fyodor died, he was childless leaving no heir to continue the Rurikid dynasty. I'm gonna take that off real quick. BRB. There we go, I think that, that looks a little bit better. Fyodor's only child, Feodosia, died at age two in 1594, and this brought an end to the Rurikid dynasty's 700 year long rule. Gudinov was selected as the next ruler of Russia. As an act of revenge, Gudinov had the Romanovs deported to different areas of northern Russia and other remote areas. There they faced extreme hunger amongst other harsh conditions. Fyodor Nikitich Romanov was forced to become a monk being sent to the Antoniev Slesky Monastery and was renamed Filaret. After Gudinov's dynasty fell, Filaret's approval was sought by two Dimitris who were pretending to be the late younger brother of Fyodor I. But eventually, Filaret's son, Mikhail Romanov, was offered the crown. Mikhail was unanimously elected to the position of Tsar, and with that, the Romanov dynasty began. Nikolai II Alexandrovich Romanov, or Nicholas II, was born on May 18, 1868. Although his parents initially opposed to it, he married Princess Alex of Hesse and by Rhine in late November of 1894. Princess Alex later took the name Alexandra Fyodorovna and converted to Russian Orthodoxy. Nicholas II was officially recognized as Tsar of all Russia in November of 1894 following the death of his father, Alexander III. His coronation took place a little under two years later on May 26, 1896 in Uspensky Cathedral. An event was held in Kadonka Field to let common folk join in on the celebration of Nicholas II and Alexandra's coronation as Tsar and Tsarina of all Russia on May 30th, 1896. For the celebrations, pubs, 
a town square, buffets, and more were built. The buffets, all 150 of them, were to give out gifts in honor of the new czar. A piece of sausage, gingerbread, a specially made coronation cup, and other things as well. People began to gather the night before the celebrations were to begin, and by the time morning came, thousands of people had swarmed the area. Rumors began to circulate amongst the crowds that there weren't enough supplies for everyone there and the group rushed to claim theirs. This resulted in almost 1,400 people being trampled to death, and around 1,300 more were hurt. Even though there was a police force of about 2,000 men there, they still were basically helpless in trying to stop the crowd. Now, even with all of these deaths, the events seemed to carry on as though nothing had happened in a different area of the large field. By the time Nicholas and Alexandra made their appearance around 2 p.m., there seemed to be nothing left of the incident. Nicholas was not informed of the incident until much later. When he was made aware, he decided that it would be best to not attend the festivities for his coronation later that night and to instead stay behind in solidarity with his people. His uncles convinced him to go since they felt it would be worse for him if he didn't show up. The commemorative coronation cup became known as the Cup of Sorrows in reference to the events at Kadonka Field, and the incident was seen as a bad omen, almost a sign of what was to come when Nicholas was in power, earning the Tsar the new nickname, Nicholas the Bloody, with later events only seeming to affirm this nickname. Nicholas and Alexander were going to have five children together, four daughters, Olga, Tatiana, Maria, Anastasia, and one son, the heir apparent, Tsarevich Alexei. Tsarina Alexandra, of German descent, proved to be quite unpopular with the Russian people due to her heritage. Many of the Russian people considered Alexandra to be a German spy. Their only son, Alexei, was born with hemophilia, a hereditary condition in which fatal bleeding can be caused by minor cuts or bruises, even just like little bumps. Now this is caused by the blood not clotting properly whenever an injury occurs. And according to CDC statistics, approximately one out of every 5,000 male children will inherit the disease. Alexandra's family and her relation to Queen Victoria led to her being a carrier for the disease and passing it on to her son. Now this also led to many royals throughout Europe spreading the condition since many of Victoria's descendants married into royal houses all throughout Europe. To treat Alexei's condition, the Tsarina turned to a man by the name of Grigory Rasputin who first met the royal couple in 1905. On January 22, 1905, protesters began to march towards the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg. Nicholas II was not present at the palace, and soldiers were instructed to stop the protests, the aim of which was to present the Tsar with a petition in hopes of improving the lives of the people of the lower classes. Soldiers opened fire on the groups, injuring upwards of 800 civilians and leaving at least a couple hundred dead. These numbers are uncertain due to the propaganda that was being circulated in this period to turn people against the Tsar. This became known as Bloody Sunday and the events tarnished the Tsar's reputation, thus reinforcing the nickname Nicholas the Bloody. In 1906, Rasputin began acting as Alexei's personal healer. In 1907, after one of his bleeding episodes, Alexandra asked Rasputin to pray for her son, and he seemingly miraculously recovered by the next morning. This led the Tsarina to develop a fierce attachment to him, making her believe that he was the only one that could treat her son's condition. Using his influence gained from being closely associated to the royal family, he began a life of controversy. He accepted sexual favors and bribes, and gained increasing influence over the royal family themselves. He was declared a heretic in 1907, and when the Tsarina was confronted by others with the information on Rasputin's debauchery, she refused to believe it. She in no way could believe that such a powerful, mystic man of God could be possible of doing such things. Rasputin himself has been considered a huge factor in the downfall of the imperial family. Each time he seemed to stop one of Alexei's bleeding episodes, it, it seemed like his power over them grew, many of which were thought to be because he 
didn't allow Alexei to be treated with aspirin, which would thin his blood, thus making the bleeding and the hemophilia worse. Rasputin was later executed after becoming too closely involved with the affairs of the royal family. While Nicholas II was away and taking command of the troops, this left the Tsarina and Rasputin in charge, and this led to widespread dissent amongst the Russian people. Vladimir Perishkovich once said that the advisors to the Tsar had, quote, been turned into marionettes, marionettes whose threads have been taken firmly in hand by Rasputin and the Empress Fyodorovna, the evil genius of Russia in the Tsarina, who has remained a German on the Russian throne and an alien to the country and its people." End quote. The murder took place on December 30th, 1916, when a group of people led by Prince Yusupov brought Rasputin to Yusupov's home. The events of that night have been widely debated, but it is said that he died of gunshot wounds to the head. Another account says that he was poisoned with cakes and wine, but it seemingly had no effect on him. He was shot in the stomach. When they later went back to make sure that he was dead, he, Rasputin, jumped up and attacked Yusupov, who escaped from his grasp. He was then shot again by Perishkovich and later tossed into the freezing Malaya Nevka River. Please forgive my pronunciation of this stuff, guys. During the late 1910s, the Romanovs were becoming more and more unpopular amongst the Russian people. Roars of revolution were growing stronger and louder than ever. With more military losses and mishandlings mounting, members of the Duma and provisional government demanded that Nicholas II abdicate the throne. Many factors left Nicholas with no choice but to comply, and he issued his abdication first in favor of his son Alexei. He later changed it to abdicate on his son's behalf and also in favor of his brother, Grand Duke Michael, as the next czar. And here in just a moment, I'm going to read you the text of Nicholas II's abdication. I'll just do my highlighter real quick, you know. Now, Nicholas II announced his abdication in a manifesto signed on March 16th, 1917. And this is his manifesto itself, quote, in the days of the great struggle against the foreign enemies, who for nearly three years have tried to enslave our fatherland, the Lord God has been pleased to send down on Russia a new heavy trial. Internal popular disturbances threaten to have a disastrous effect on the future conduct of this persistent war. The destiny of Russia, the honor of our heroic army, the welfare of the people, and the whole future of our dear fatherland demand that the war should be brought to a victorious conclusion whatever the cost. The cruel enemy is making his last efforts, and already the hour approaches when our glorious army, together with our gallant allies, will crush him. In these decisive days in the life of Russia, we thought it our duty of conscience to facilitate for our people the closest union possible and a consolidation of all national forces for the speedy attainment of victory. In agreement with the Imperial Duma, we have thought it well to renounce the throne of the Russian Empire and to lay down the supreme power. As we do not wish to part from our beloved son, we transmit our succession to our brother, the Grand Duke Michael Alexandrovich, and give him our blessing to mount the throne of the Russian Empire. We direct our brother to conduct the affairs of state in full and inviolable union with the representatives of the people and the legislative bodies on those principles which will be established by them and on which he will take an inviolable oath. I cannot say that word. In the name of our dearly beloved homeland, we call on our faithful sons of the fatherland to fulfill their sacred duty to the fatherland, to obey the czar in the heavy moment of national trials, and to help him, together with the representatives of the people, to guide the Russian Empire on the road to victory, welfare, and glory. May the Lord God help Russia. Now, the abdication of Nicholas II was met with many things, including anger and fear and joy, and some people weren't sure what was happening, and it was, there was just so much going on at the time. One thing Nicholas did not expect was for his brother Michael to reject the throne. Michael said that he would not accept the throne until the public was given a chance to vote either in favor of continuing the monarchy or abolishing it. And with that, Russia was left without a czar. Hello? No, it's okay. It's cute. Hi, baby. 
Now, Michael's refusal left Russia without a czar and no certain direction of where to go. Now, Nicholas himself, along with the provisional government, preferred for the dethroned family to go into exile, with the best option being the UK. Government officials initially granted the family asylum. The offer of asylum was later rescinded by King George V after his council became worried that Nicholas's presence within the United Kingdom was spark an uprising. On March 20th, 1917, with nowhere left to go, the imperial family became imprisoned under house arrest at Sarskoye Selo. Now, while they were given a lot of privacy, a lot of their actions were heavily monitored. A lot of their servants and staff also came with them, not wanting to part with the family. In August of 1917, it was decided to move the family from Sarskoye Selo to a safer location in Tobolsk. A lot of officials felt that the family would be in danger if they stayed there and needed to move them to a safer location due to the possibility of any more uprisings reaching them. Now, Tobolsk was pretty remote. It was approximately about 150 miles from the nearest railway station, so they didn't have to worry about trains or anything like that. Boris Soloviev, the husband of the daughter of Rasputin, tried to organize a rescue mission for the royal family, but nothing panned out. Now, while at the Tobolsk residence, the family's activities on the grounds were further restricted. Their hours were limited as to where they could be on the grounds in certain areas. And Nicholas was even asked not to wear his uniform outside anymore. When the Bolsheviks came to power, they restricted the family even further, only allowing them to eat military rations. In the spring of 1918, the family was moved to Katerinburg, in which they were imprisoned in the Apatiev House, also known as the House's Special Purpose. Here, their conditions were even more strict and their staff was reduced even more. While it was initially intended that Nicholas would undergo a show trial, the situation escalated even further to where they needed to decide what to do with the former czar immediately. On July 17th, 1918, the family was awoken in the middle of the night and told to go into the basement. They were told that this was for their protection due to military forces being in the vicinity. Along with Nicholas and Alexandra were their five children, their doctor, in three servants. Alexei was too weak to walk, so his father had carried him down, and they brought in two chairs, one for the former Tsarina and one for former Tsarevich Alexei. After they were seated, a Bolshevik officer named Yakov Yurovsky informed them that they were to be executed. According to Yurovsky's account, Nicholas could only say what? And according to Yurovsky, he quickly repeated the order. And according to Peter Ermakov, Nicholas said, you know not what you do. Without wasting another moment, they fired. The attack upon the family lasted approximately 20 minutes, but not all of the children died immediately. The girls had essentially created bulletproof vests for themselves. Alexandra thought that their escape from Russia was inevitable and she had them sew their valuable jewels into their corsets and their clothing, and this shielded them from the initial impact of the bullets. When they realized that the girls were not dying, they began stabbing them with bayonets and then finally killing them with gunshots to the head. Their bodies were later moved to a wooded area, doused with sulfuric acid to disfigure them, and stripped naked, their clothing being burned. They were originally thrown into a mine shaft, but they discovered that it was too shallow, so they instead decided to move the bodies and bury them in two separate graves. They hoped that by burying them in separate graves, it would help confuse people and create confusion to where the bodies may never be identified. Since the royal family seemingly disappeared, there were many imposters that came along, some pretending to be Alexei, some pretending to be Anastasia, and a few others that tried to claim the Romanov throne. So I changed my lip color. I did a little bit of a pinky liquid lipstick and then put a little bit of sunkissed mm -hmm. over top. For almost 100 days after the execution of the Tsar and his family, multiple other relatives and friends were executed, including the Tsar's brother Michael. In 1979, the bodies of the Tsar, the Tsarina, three of their children, and four of the other non-relatives that were with them were found. 
even though they were found in 1979, it was kept a secret until 1991, until after the collapse of the Soviet Union. After they were identified by a DNA, they were laid to rest in the St. Catherine Chapel of the Peter and Paul Cathedral in St. Petersburg on July 17, 1998. Even though there was some controversy surrounding this, Nicholas and members of his family were recognized as saints in 1981 by the Russian Orthodox Church abroad. In the year 2000, they were recognized not as martyrs, but as passion bearers by the Russian Orthodox Church. Now, the reason that they were mainly recognized as passion bearers instead of full-on saints was because their death was not caused by their religious beliefs. Instead, they feel like they met their death with Christian humility. In 2007, the bodies of Alexei and one of his sisters were discovered in a nearby grave in Yekaterinburg, not far from the original one that held most of the Romanov family. DNA tests later concluded that these were, in fact, the bodies of the Tsarevich and one of the Grand Duchesses. The church has still not yet buried Alexei and his sister with the rest of his family, even though the DNA confirmed that they were children of Nicholas II. They feel that they still need more conclusive testing, even though the DNA tests repeatedly prove that they are of Romanov descent. And I think that that's it for me today. That basically concludes the story. I'll try to leave a pinned comment in case there was any kind of misinformation that I find while I'm editing or any updates to the story in the future. I plan on coming back to it and putting in a little note. And I really hope you guys enjoyed. I'm sorry if my energy is a little bit weird, <laughs> but I have worked really hard on this video and trying to get the script done and everything for it. And the look didn't exactly turn out the way that I wanted it to, but it's not bad. You guys should have seen the makeup I did the other day. I'll try to put a picture over here. Cause see, I can do makeup. Just apparently not whenever I'm trying to film. <laughs> right, one of my eyelashes is trying to pop off too. Oh no! Oh it did, it popped all the way off. Well, I gotta put this back on for pictures, but let me know what you guys want to see next time. And I think that's it for me. <laughs> All right. Oh, and make sure to like and subscribe, please. And leave me a comment to let me know what you want to see. Okay. Bye.